Now, uh, I put some link over here. The first link is the, is the glory of American law terms. Uh, so these, uh, basically, it gives you an overview about some of the terms that you will, uh, will be using in this unit or some of the terms that you read in books and also uh, be using in the industry. Uh, I'm not saying you should understand these terms or get to know the, uh, the in and out of these terms. So I'm not uh, asking you to be a legal uh, person, but reading it will give you some kind of idea about the terms. And then the second link give you explanation of those legal terms. Again, I'm not saying you should be a legal person to read into that, but it's, it's good if you, uh, you, you read much more about them so that you uh, familiarize yourself with the terms and as we are discussing uh, going through this uh, unit, you, you clearly have understanding of exactly what uh, those terms are. And it also make you to be uh, ahead of ahead of time and ahead of uh, uh, the terms that you may come across. So that, that, that is just about the focus question and this link. So you can use the link. Uh, the link is also available in Malo. You can, you can, you can use them. So let's begin our today's uh, discussion. Today's discussion, we are starting with the contract of carriage of goods. So uh, first of all, the, uh, I just want to ask uh, that anyone can give us a clear maybe difference between charter party contract and then a bill of lady contract. Anyone want, want to volunteer? You, you, uh, as we go through, uh, feel free to ask questions. You can also ask questions by just uh, testing. Uh, I, will, I will respond to, to your questions as well. And feel free also to, to ask uh, questions uh, just by voicing out yourself. So anyone uh, want to help uh, about the difference between the charter party contracts and the bill of lending? Um. No, is it bill of lading is the um, official paperwork um, when either loading or unloading the goods. I can't quite remember, but the charter party um, contract is the um, agreement um, that's negotiated between um, the charterer and the charteree, the uh, the shipper and the charter party, or the charter party. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so did everyone get up uh, point? So the what um, he's saying, yeah, you know, what he's saying, and it means is that the the bill of lading is a contract of carriage, where the charter party is a contract signed between the ship owner and the charter for the hire of the vessel. So charter party contract is for the hire of the vessel, and the bill of lading contract is a contract of carriage. So therefore, uh, contract of carriage of goods is the bill of lading. So if you're using the bill of lading or if a bill of lading is being issued to you, it means that the, the, the ship owner or the carrier has your cargo on board. So you have that contract of carriage, he's carrying your cargo for you. But the charter party contract is simple, means that the charter or the cargo owner and the ship, uh, shipper or the charter and the, the charter and the ship owner has a contract where the, the ship owner is hiring his vessel to, uh, to the charter. Now, other the charter party, uh, as we discussed uh, just a, a, a moment ago, uh, we mentioned about the three type of charter parties. The, the, the last one, which is the void charter party, also can be considered as a contract of carriage. So void charter party is contract of car carriage as well, just like the bill of the day. But the rest to time charter and the demise charter are not contract of carriage, they are contract of hire. So let's look at the contract of carriage in terms of the size of, of cargo. If um, a, ship, uh, a ship owner is being approached by a charter or cargo owner, and this cargo owner is having a cargo maybe to the size of maybe 70,000 tons of rice to ship from USA to uh, any part in Eastern Europe. Now, as a ship owner, if a charter approach this, uh, this charter or the cargo owner, uh, probably maybe looking for to sign a contract 
as a, a single voyage contract to carry the 70,000 tons of rice from one port to another because uh, with that 70,000 tons of rice, the, the, the ship owner can, can use maybe Panama-sized vessel, which will be able to, to load that entire cargo for just one single voyage. So therefore, the voyage at a party contract will be signed. But for the same uh, scenario, uh, if the tonnage has increased, so uh, the, the, the quantity of rice to move uh, increased to about 900,000 uh, 900, tons of uh, rice to move from USA to Europe, and at this context, it will be impossible for the ship owner and the charter to engage, uh, assign a voyage, uh, single voyage uh, contract of carry to carry the cargo from one port to another. That's simple because the size is too big, no single vessel can carry. Uh, besides, we don't have any vessel up to that tune of uh, 900,000 tons DWT. The maximum uh, size of vessel we have is about 500,000 tons DWT. So with 900,000 tons of cargo to carry, the ship owner and the charterer or the cargo owner will engage in a contract of affrightment contract of affrightment to, to transport that cargo for a certain period of time within the, the contract. And if again, that rice that is the, the chakra or the cargo owner has, it is just a small size of, of rice, which is put in a box and it back into maybe hundred bags of rice. And then the, the, ship, uh, the, the shipper or the cargo owner puts those rice of back in 20 foot containers staff them into one 20 foot container that cargo owner will not approach the ship owner to sign a voyage uh, a single voyage contract uh, to hide the whole vessel or sign a contract of affrightment it is possible because it's just shipping one 20 foot container therefore uh, he will be signing a contract where a bill of lading will be used so in this case the bill of lading so the size the, so the size the cargo if the, 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 the size is very small bill of lading will be used and depending on the size, it might, they may use some type of affrightment. Now, with a bill of lading, uh, we are talking about negotiable instrument or negotiable bill of lading or original bill of lading. If we say a negotiable instrument, it simply means uh, that bill of lading transfer of ownership can, can occur. So you can transfer ownership of, of the cargo to another uh, person or the title of ownership can be passed on to uh, another person. And, the original or negotiable instrument uh, bill of lading will be used uh, because at the port of discharge where the cargo will be offloaded, by law, the shipping company at the destination, destination or shipping line will only release the cargo to the name concerning on the bill of lading if he presents original bill of lading or negotiable uh, bill of lading. And the if on the, he released the cargo to someone without the original bill of lading, that shipping line may be liable for, for damage should in case another person presents original bill of lading after such person has taken delivery of the cargo. So negotiable instrument or the or, uh, negotiable bill of lading will be used in, in this case. Now, with the don't, don't worry too much about the bill of lading because in model eight, we shall talk much more into detail about the bill of lading. Model eight focus much on bill of lading. And now if a bill of lading, uh, the, the receiver at the destination didn't have the original bill of lading and the cargo has arrived, he need to take possession of the cargo. And the the shipping line by law, he need to present the original bill of lading that he can take delivery of the cargo. In that, in that case, what can the, the, the cargo owner do? The receiver at the destination, who is a concerning, what can he do? A, any, anyone that... A, a, anyone want, want to help? So uh, what I'm saying is uh, the original bill of lading needs to be presented as the destination to the shipping line at the destination for the cargo to be released to the name concerning on the bill. Now, if the original bill of lading is not there, the cargo has arrived at the destination, the, 
the receiver, which is the concern, he didn't have the original bill of lading, what can he do to, to receive his cargo or her cargo? Uh, by presenting the bill of lading to the to the ship owner or the charterer, they are able to claim their to claim their cargo, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, they, he have to uh, he or she have to present the original bill of lading uh, yeah. to the shipping company at the destination in order to receive his cargo or her cargo. But what what I'm asking is, uh, should in case the the receiver didn't have have the original bill of lading in his hand, how can he take delivering of the cargo? Because by law, uh, the, by law, the shipping line have to see the original bill of lading before uh, they release the cargo to the to the owner. And, and anyone want to volunteer to to help? Um, I think uh, they can uh, ask for a signed declaration saying that the ship owners would not be liable if there's any damage thereafter. Yeah, so th 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 that that is correct. So they they will they will say declaration, and they, they, that is what we call indemnity. So the 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 receiver or the consignee, the the cargo owner, have to sign indemnity to indemnify the the uh, the the carrier or the shipping line that should in case he take control or he take delivery of the cargo and then somebody else later present the original bill of lading that he is or she is the true owner of the cargo he is liable to pay to the to the ship owner or to pay any damage that may occur and this indemnity mostly it, it will be issued by the bank it is the bank that will issue this indemnity and that also led us to the seaway bill. So because of this issue, uh, the cargo arriving, uh, original bill of lading is not there for the receiver to use to receive cargo, uh, probably maybe because the transit time is short. Uh, these days, the transit time are pretty much short. And from the time that the shipper is, because it's the shipper who has to send the original bill of lading to the receiver, not the shipping line. So from the time that the shipper is sending courier the original bill of lading, uh, either their DHL or whatever means to the uh, receiver at the destination, sometimes the ship arrives very early and then the receiver don't have the original bill of lading. So to avoid this, uh, a seaway bill will be issued. So seaway bill is simple, uh, is just a, uh, a, a message, a tele-message or an email sent by the shipper or the, the shipping line at the port of loading to the destination port that you can release the cargo to the name concerning without presenting the original bill of lading. So seaway bill make it easier. And the seaway bill, uh, because of that, seaway bill does not fulfill all the three conditions of a bill of lading. It fulfills two conditions, but it doesn't fulfill all the three. The last condition that a seaway bill doesn't fulfill is that it's not a negotiable instrument, which means you can't transfer ownership if you're having a seaway bill. Seaway bill is just fulfilled only to condition that you have a contract uh, of carriage with, with the carrier. So it, the re recently, seaway bill is very common. Even if the transit time is not short, people tend to use seaway bill in order to avoid this issue. Cargo arriving, original bill of lady is not there, so you have to wait or go through legal process uh, the, the bank to indemnify you before you claim your cargo. So that is the reason why these days seaway bill is very common for shipping companies or shipping line to use or shippers and concerning uh, to use. A any 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 question regarding uh, that area? All right, so let's move to charter parties. So char charter parties, as I mentioned previously, it can be divided into 
two areas, that is demise and non-demise charter parties. So non-demise charter party can also be split further into two, which is time charter and then a void charter party. So the void charter, as we, may, we also mentioned in the previous uh, slides, we say void charter is also a contract of courage, just like the bill of lading is also a contract of courage. So when a void charter party is signed, it signifies that there is a contract of courage. But if a time charter party contract is signed, it doesn't signify that it's a contract of courage. It's, it just shows that there is a contract of power as the same as the demand charter. It also signifies that there is a contract of power of the vessel. Now, so the, between the time and the demand charter party, what is the, the difference between the time and the demand? Can anybody help? What, what is the difference? Because demands and time, they are all just hiring a vessel for a period of time. So what, what is the difference between the, the two? And, any volunteer? Um, for a demise charter party, the charter has to supply the crew and everything, whereas a non-demise charter party, the ship owner supplies the crew and they pay for other individual um, costs yeah 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 so yeah that that, that, that is true so that, that 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 is yeah that's correct so this um so the, the clear difference between the two are for any charter parties uh for charter party that is signed for a period of time which there is a high obviously there is some level of control over the level of control by charter over the vessel and that is to say that the charter has some commercial control responsibility over the vessel, which means the charter has a right to direct the vessel, which port the vessel should go, uh, which cargo the vessel should load, which area the, the, the vessel should go. So the charter has that control over the vessel. So under any uh, charter where the, the vessel is half a period of time, the charter has that control over the vessel. And on, on the other side, the ship owners have authority and has possession over the vessel, which means that the ship owners has the right and authority to hire crew, uh, dummy captain and his crew, and th the same ship owner has that authority also to fire them, to sack the, 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 the captain and his crew. So if that authority, ship owner has aut that authority, we say the ship owner has possession over the vessel. Now, if this authority, this possession is being given out, if the ship owner give out this possession to a charter, then this is what we call a demise charter. So what if a, a, a charter now has that authority to employ crew and also has the authority to fire them, then that charter has possession over the vessel. In that sense, then that will be termed as a demise charter. So that makes a difference. So under the demise, Chara, the, the Chara has that possession over the vessel, not just only control, it has the control and also has the possession. But under the time Chara, the Chara only has control. It, it doesn't have possession. So that makes the difference between uh, the two uh, Chara parties, the, the demise and then the, the time Chara party. Is, is, that, is that clear or any, any, any confusion there or anybody didn't get anything clear? All good? Right. So with Bell of Flitting that we, we just discussed briefly, um, I put some sample quiz question here. Which, which one do you think would be the, the correct answer here? I think it's D. Yeah, Oscar, good. A any anybody? Any anybody with different? So Oscar, go for D. Any any? Any other person with any different view or different point? 
Should we all go for day? Yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, th I think I think day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the yeah perfect consensus is on day. Yeah. So the day is the correct answer. That's awesome. Good. Then um, another one here. Which one would be the correct answer here? I think it's the late time. So D, Oscar go for D. Yeah. Yeah, D again. Yeah, D again, I think. Also. Yes, so that, that is also correct. Yeah, the day, yeah, the late time. Late time will, will be the area where this will, to, will arise between, yeah, the ship on the chakra under the voyage chara. That's correct. Also, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, so now let's look at some of the, the standard uh, uh, charabari forms. So in, in the freight market, uh, the, the ship owner and the chara are free to negotiate uh, their charapari terms. So they, they are free to use whatever charapari negotiation they want to engage in. But most commonly, uh, the ship owner and the chakra normally use the standard charapari forms as a basis for in which negotiation uh, will start. Because the reason why they will, they will use the standard uh, charapari forms is because those standard charapari forms have been used over the years, and it, uh, it has been tested in legal barrel, uh, that means have been taken to court over time. So you, you, you definitely know where the issues are, which issues can, can be controversial, and which issues are not clear, so you, you know. And if that issue, should get that issue get to court, you know the outcome already and how controversial the outcome may be. So based on that, you can start your negotiation by looking at those areas that you, you think they are not really clear are vague so you try to negotiate those areas rather than you going in fresh try to negotiate everything from from a scratch which is also acceptable you can do it but it, it just gives you so much work and also you don't know that if those contracts you are negotiating from a scratch if something happened there is a breach of a contract so how will it end in the legal court you don't really know the outcome so this standard forms serve as a basis for start a negotiation. Now, there are some international organizations which are quite active in the, in the, in the market of uh, formation, revision, and updating these charter party forms. And some of these uh, international organizations that are active and revising these charter party forms are the, uh, the ones on the slides over here. Uh, so BIMCO, which is the Baltic and International Maritime Council, and then we also have the ASWA USA, uh, which is the Association of Ship Brokers and Agent USA. We also have the FUNESBA, which is also active. Uh, FUNESBA is the Federation of National Association of Ship Brokers and Agents. And we also have the Intertaco, which is for the Independent Tackle uh, Owners Association. And these uh, organizations are active uh, revising or updating the charter party form so that they can be in line with the trade in which they are intended to and also due to uh, the the dimension that changes in trade and over time and with technology as well they try to revise and update these charter party forms so that they can be really aligned with the current challenges in, in the uh, in the environment but having said that there are also some international associations, for example, like uh, UK Chambers of Shipping and the J Japan Shipping Exchange, these uh, international associations are also there having their own standard charter party forms, which is also there for, for you to use or members to use. And then we also have the chartering groups, which are also there also coming up with their uh, charter party forms. And if you are using a national association uh, charter party forms, you are not um, required to amend any terms of the charter party without seeking approval or permission from the association. So if you're using, you are obliged compulsory to use it, uh, but you can't amend. But with the 
the standard charter party forms, uh, which the organization that I mentioned previously uh, issuing, you have you are free to uh, to change them without seeking any approval from any uh, any of those uh, organizations that are issuing it. And beside that, we also have the oil major company, which also have their own specific individual charter party forms they use. Uh, so those oil majors like Shell, BP, Mobile, uh, Chevron, and all other those major Shell companies, uh, oil companies, they have their own charter party form. So for example, if you are signing a charter party contract with Shell, you are going to use the Shell time for their own specific charter party uh, form and you are not going to use any contract, uh, charter party contract outside that. You are solely going to be conformed to that uh, shell time for charter party form. That is what you are going to, to use. We'll look at some example of those charter party forms uh, uh, briefly in, in the next uh, slide. So uh, although, uh, as I said, BIMCO and other organizations are actively uh, producing uh, many charter party forms in, in the market, which are standard charter party forms uh, people are using, but those individual organizations or oil majors, they have their own specific, which you have to use if you are engaging a charter party contract with, with them. Any, any, any question? Before we look at a ch charter party uh, uh, layout, All right. So if you take a charter party uh, forms and you, if you have a look at, at the form, you will notice some common parallels that are usual uh, for the charter party forms. And the charter party uh, form has a code names which reflect the intended usage of, of the form. So for example, if you take a uh, cement void uh, form, charter party form, it, it's intended to be used for cement voyage so carrying of the cement uh, for, for a void, that is what cement void uh, form is, is for. If that is an intended in, intention for, for, for that form. Now, with uh, these uh, charter party forms, if, as I said, if you have a look, they, you will see some common pattern, especially if you, you, you take the Genco uh, 94 forms or uh, Amwesh 93 forms, you will see that the form has two parts. You have part one and then the part two. Uh, part one is it give uh, the brief uh, description and part one, if you look at the Genco form, which is uh, available in Malo, if you look at the appendices, those forms are, are there. Uh, so the Genco forms, if you pick the Genco form, you look the part one, which form the boxes. So you will see no, a number of boxes uh, boxes with numbers inside and so those boxes simply give you an indication of the necessary information uh, for the pi parties to com complete and those information will include uh, the, the ship name, uh, the ship's uh, owners and the ship owners place of business, the charter's name, the charter uh, place of business, ship broker, uh, the, uh, the, the port of loading, port of discharge and and then also the position of the vessel, uh, where the vessel is a position at the time the contract is being designed, all those and the freight rate, all those form the part of the part, uh, the part A of the, uh, the general form. And those part A will be completed by both party. And then the second part, and so this is what the part A that you will see giving details of the vessel name, the, uh, uh, the position of the vessel, the cargo that need to be loaded, the tonnage that will be loaded, those, those areas, that is what we call the preambles. So th those are the preambles, the boxes that if you pick a Genco, for example, those boxes that you see in the party, those are what we call the pre preambles. And after the preambles, you go to the part two or the second part. The second part is what we call the main clauses or the written clauses. So. The main clause is that is why the major discussion focus on. So the discussion between the ship owner and the charterer with regard to which clause to, to change, which clause to revise, which clause, clause to delete, which clause to add, it's been the main discussion is been on the main clause or the printed clause as uh, we, we say sometimes. 
So the discussion will be around that. And once they agree on, on which clauses that need to be removed and which clauses need to be added, that will be done on the main clause. So if you pick the general form, the part two, you will see the main clause uh, has a number. So you will see from maybe number one up to up to 100, or number one up to 200, or number one up to 500, depending on the form that you are, you, you are looking at or the charter party form that you are signing. Some, some of the, the charter party forms in the second part, part two, they have a very long of main clauses that you need to, to deal with. So once the, 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 the main clauses that that discussion is, be, is being done, the other part of the charter party forms is what we call riders. So the riders, simple riders means that the, upon the discussion between the charter and the ship owners, whatever that they have agreed that they are going to add it to the main clauses, those are what we call riders. So the riders are individual clauses that they have agreed to add to the main clauses. So that is what we call riders. So again, after discussing much discussion on the main clauses, which one to remove, which are made, then they will use riders to add to the uh, main clauses. And apart from riders, we also have what we call uh, addendums. Addendums are simple as side letters. So side letters being issued in addition to the charter party uh, contract. And why do they use addendums? They use addendums simply because they want to keep certain information confidential. They want to keep certain information private, which should not be part of the main charter party contract. So anybody who picked the charter party contract, they want certain information, they want to keep confidential that they, anybody pick charter party contract cannot see those information. And that is what they will use at their rooms aside later. So issues like a freight rate, maybe uh, the two parties have agreed on the freight rate and they want to keep that freight rate agreement very confidential, then they will use addendums as a side letter to add to the charter party. So that freight rate information is being kept confidential between the, the parties. So if you pick up their charter party forms, you will only see the main clauses with the, the freight rate, which might be the main, uh, the, 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 the flat freight rate, which is in the, on the, uh, on the uh, charter party forms, as you will see in the part A in the box. But they have addendums on the actual charter party, uh, um, the freight that they have agreed on, they will put it in the side, uh, the, that addendum as a side letter, they will put it in it and, and they keep separate. So those information or, or any other information apart from freight trade they want to keep very confidential, then they will use addendum as, as, as a means to keep those information. So this, this is what we call the charter party layout. So you see the layout in this form, but mostly most of the charter party, you see the preamble under the main clauses that, is, that constitute the charter party uh, form or the layout. Then, Riders will be used to add certain uh, clauses, and then addendum is used to keep certain confidential uh, issue. As I said, sadly, letter to keep certain information very confidential. Any 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 question? Great. Now let's look at some of the terms that you may here or when you pick a charter party contract and you are reading the charter party contract, you may see certain terms that will appear in the charter party contract. So you will see terms like condition, terms like warranty, innominated terms, imply and express terms. These terms, if you're reading the charter party, actual charter party contract, you will meet these terms. Uh, so the conditions, Any, anyone can tell us what conditions are? in the charter party contract or in other the charter parties. If you see uh, conditions, what does that mean? Um, so it, the, any party that expressly provides that clause in a charter party is a condition. So if they, if they expressly provide a clause, it's classified as a condition. Yeah, yeah. so that, that, that would be considered as a, uh, as a condition and also as a warranty based on the 
on the level of the, the clause that they have introduced into the charter party. So in, in, that, in that case, the clause that they, they are introducing can, can fall within the two, uh, the condition and the warranty as well. Anyone also uh, with different uh, idea what uh, the conditions uh, is or the condition might be? A anyone want to uh, also give give a shot? Give it a give it a go. Well, a condition is just a really, really important term that if it was to be breached, then the, then the contract can be voided by the people who haven't breached it. Yeah, so yeah, that, 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 is, that is true, that's correct. So uh, the, the conditions are the, the terms that go to right to the heart of the contract. So any, any term that go right to the heart of the contract and which simply means that if such, a, such terms is being breached or such information is, or such condition is being breached, then the contract is being attempted to be void. The other innocent party can, can avoid the contract or discharge him, himself. So the condition, as you mentioned, the condition are such important that if such a condition is breached, the other innocent party, the other party to the contract has a right to avoid the contract or cancel the contract. Uh, so uh, for, for, for example, a condition uh, might be if you, you've ordered uh, a new car and then in, to, to the manufacturers, uh, uh, you ask them that your car should be delivered at the end of July and then uh, that is what you've agreed with the car manufacturer. And the car manufacturer at the end of July didn't deliver your car to, uh, to you. And you waited to August, you, you didn't receive your car. Probably maybe you need your car for special in vain. And at the end of August, the car is not being delivered and to September. That really is a condition. It really go, goes into the heart of the contract. So you, the, the purpose in which you need a car for is the, you didn't have it, so you have a right to terminate the contract. To ask the manufacturers that you don't, you don't need, you don't need a contract anymore. You don't need a car anymore because you, the agreement was the car should be delivered to you at the end of July, and up to September you didn't receive the car. Maybe you need a car for special events. So yeah, you can terminate such a contract. And if we we take it to to the shipping terms, uh, condition might be uh, issue with regard to to the to the freight rate. So it's as a charter, uh, you hire the vessel and it's been agreed that you pay a high per day. And that high that you need to pay to the ship owner per day, uh, if you default that, that, that payment, you default that payment and over time, the ship owner has a right to cancel the contract, to, to, to cancel the contract and take the vessel uh, from you because that go right goes to the heart of the contract. And then beside the condition, we also have warranty. W warranty, uh, anyone, anyone want to give a go uh, with warranty? That what warranty may mean in the charter party contract. Anyone want to give it a go about warranty? What the warranty, the term warranty mean in, in a charter party contract? All right. So uh, warranty are the are the terms or the or, or the terms which, if the warranties are breached, uh, are not really warranty. Really, don't go to the heart of the of the of the contract. So therefore. If warranty is breached, uh, the other party, the innocent party, will not avoid the contract, will not cancel the contract, or will not exit from the contract, but rather will stay in the contract but seek damage or seek uh, 
damage for the bridge that has been breached by the other party. So again, if we, we take it to, to the car example that I, I've just mentioned, if they are in an agreement, you've been, you agree with the car manufacturers that your new car, you, you just want them to uh, put um, a environmental monitoring co condition uh, that, that you can use to moni monitor your, uh, uh, the environmental pollution uh, system, this, this kind of monitoring that you just need, environmental monitoring uh, company system that you can monitor how you are polluting. So you agree on this, and then in the actual uh, sense, the car is being delivered to you at the time that you need it, but you realize that this environmental control monitor is not being fitted in the car for you to know how much pollution you are producing or your car is producing. They don't put this system in it for you to monitor. And this, you will not consider this as a, a serious breach which will make you to uh, reject the car or, or the, avoid the contract. No, rather you will, you, will seek, you will seek damages for them not facing this in the car for you. So uh, you, they, they will either have to pay you for the damage for not facing it or they have to reface it. So this will not uh, cause you to cancel the contract altogether, but rather you will, you will seek damages or you will seek remedy for, for the breach. So in the same sense, in the shipping terms, if we take, um, uh, you, the, you hire a vessel and during uh, the, the hire, the ship owner says that uh, the vessel uh, can, can go uh, 18 knots uh, when fully loaded, and then you hire the vessel in actual operation, maybe the vessel is not doing 17 or 16 knots. If the vessel is doing 16 or 17 knots instead of 18 knots, this you will not consider this as a as a condition. You will consider this as a warranty. Uh, so therefore, you may seek for remedy or damages that the the ship owner has breached this contract. The vessel is not actually doing 18 knots. So therefore, you will seek damages. He need to pay you some damages for that. But if the uh, not the vessel owner promised 18 knots and then in actual reality you're operating the vessel and the vessel is just doing 10 knots and that deficiency is so huge so you may consider that as a condition therefore get out of the contract or terminate the contract altogether but if the vessel is doing 17 or 16 uh, instead of 18 that should be considered as a warranty so the is, is the difference be between warranty and the condition clear? In, o o over time, at the legal court um, or with legal ruling, the, the legal people have blended these two uh, terms, the condition and warranty over time, and then uh, came out what we call the innominated terms. So the innominated terms are simple means that if there is a breach, you, the innocent party has a right either to terminate the contract or to seek damages, depending on the severity of the, of the breach that the other party has breached. So if the ship will not breach, um, you, you will consider it under in nominated term. If the, that breach is severe, then you consider it as a, as a condition and then avoid the contract or get out of the contract. But if what the breach that the ship on a breach is not severe, then you will consider that as a warranty and stay in the contract and then seek damages. Now, beside these uh, terms, uh, in nominated terms uh, or warranty or condition, we also have the express terms and then the implied terms. So the, the implied terms or the express terms, uh, anybody can help us with the difference between the implied terms or the express terms. First, the implied terms. Any, any, any volunteer? So uh, in, in a charter party contract, 
the, the written terms or the terms that has been agreed and put out on paper, that is what we call the express terms. So they have agreed on the conditions and or the terms, and then they have written that those terms, those written terms, that is what we call express terms. But the implied terms are the terms that are not written, but the parties are intended to be bound by those obligations. So that as uh, implied terms. So, uh, for example, with the implied terms, uh, if you consider, okay, let, let, let me ask, with what I just uh, explained, uh, can anybody give an example of what an implied terms may be? Uh, duty of care? Yeah, so duty of care, yeah, that, that is correct. Any, any other example? Um, so, or is it... Uh the uh in handling the goods from the ship uh to the onto the dock um it just it said so we're moving this to this bag of sugar onto the onto the harbor but it would be implied that the person moving it does it in a um safe and um secure manner not just yeah. you know tossing it over overboard and throwing it as back yeah. <laughs> That, that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. Any, any other person with any other implied example that any other person also want to give? The seaworthiness of the ship. Come, come again. The seaworthiness of the ship. Exactly, yeah, seaworthiness of the ship. Yeah, that, 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 that is it, yeah. Yeah, that's also correct, yeah. So yeah, as you mentioned, the seaworthiness of the ship, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in the next slide, yeah. But before we go to the seaworthiness of the ship, uh, just another uh, quiz question here. Which one is the correct answer here? True or false? Uh, I think it's false. False? Yeah. Yeah, false. Yeah, that's correct. Perfect. Yeah, so with um, the, the seaworthiness of the ship that you, 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 you spoke about, we, we will talk about that in the next uh, slides after, after this one. So that will be considered as a uh, important. Yeah, so now let's talk about the uh, bill of lading and with regard to the Hague rule, Hague Visby rule and Hamburg rules. These are uh, rules we shall discuss, as I mentioned previously, in Model 8, we shall focus much more on these uh, rules. And when a charter party contract uh, is being signed, so the, during the transportation, the cargo may, may get damaged, and therefore, these international rules are there to apportion uh, who is responsible and what, who is responsible for what damage in whatsoever. Now, in the, when a, a charter party contract is being signed, a charter party contract is totally different from the bill of lading, as we mentioned uh, previously. So charter party is not a bill of lading. Charter party con contract is totally different from bill of lading. Now, for the charter party, when the cargo is being loaded, a bill of lading will be issued for the cargo which is loaded under the charter party. Now, the conditions for the charter party is totally different from the bill of lading, which means there will be some conflict of interest or conflict between the rules. So if the cargo is carried and then or during the voyage, something happened to, to the cargo, which rule will prevail? Will the charter party rule prevail or the bill of lading rule prevail? Because bill of lading is also issued under the charter party. Charter party contract is being signed and the bill of lading contract is also being signed. And mostly the charter party contract is signed between the charter and the ship owner, where the bill of lading uh, contract is between the charter and the cargo owner. So the, the charter issue bill of lading to the cargo owner and something happened during the voyage, which rules will, will apply? Will the bill of lading rules apply or the, or the charter party rules apply? Anyone want, want, want to help? 
uh, the bill of lading uh, would uh, would imply that the ownership of the cargo has temporarily uh, be, uh, been transferred to the master and uh, therefore the charter party rules could apply based on that because it's uh, under the ownership of the vessel yeah yeah so in yeah in in operation that will, will, will happen and that also uh, brings the issue of complexity and dynamity in, in this. Now, as you right, rightly mentioned, when the bill of lading rules apply and between the ownership of the cargo and, 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 the, and the captain or the vessel, uh, the captain, that, that bill of lading rule apply, you will realize that the extent of, extent of that rules is much more wider and when it's now come to the vessel of the charter party contract, the charter party contract is totally different, does not cover that obligation which the Bill of Leading Rules uh, gives. So it's, it becomes a bone of contention. If the captain takes that responsibility or the vessel takes that responsibility, you come to the charter party, the charter party doesn't cover that area. So it's, it's much more complicated than, than uh, you, may, you may think. If it is just a straightforward rule which that rule applied for the bill of lading is the same condition also to the charter party contract, then it's just easy, straightforward issue solved. But if different conditions apply, it becomes very dicey whether you should accept the bill of lading rules uh, or whether you should accept charter party rules. And to some extent, the, uh, the ship owner or the captain will reject uh, the bill of lading rules because they will say, uh, the contract we have is with the charter party contract. So therefore, we are not bound by that rules of the Bill of Lading. So with this kind of ambiguities and also confusion between uh, the rules, that is where most charter party contract, they want to align that both rules are in harmony. So therefore, uh, they include terms like clause paramounts. So you will see clause paramounts in uh, most charter party contract just to make sure that the bill of lady clauses or the bill of lady rules are incorporated into the charter party contract. So which means that if whatever happened under the contract of carriage, it's simple, is in the charter party contract already. So therefore, there will not be any issue of apportioning uh, blame or where the liability lies that will be solved. But that also comes with another uh, issue when you incorporate the bill of lending rules as a clause paramount into the charter party rule. First of all, the clause paramount or paramount is just mean the supreme. So when you, you incorporate the clause paramount into the charter party rules, which means that those rules uh, prevail. Uh, so whatever happened, the bill of lending rules in, in, that, in that sense will, will, will prevail. Now, with the Bill of Lady rules, especially when Hague, Hague VB rules are incorporated as a clause paramount, these rules favors ship owners. It doesn't actually really, uh, it, the, the way, uh, as I said, it favors ship owners is that it, it somehow protects ship owners to a certain extent. It relieves them from some liability. So therefore, as a chapter, when you are incorporating these, um, Close paramount into the into the charter party contract. You have to really know in and out of which clauses that you are incorporating. When you are signing, the ship owners will incorporate close paramount, which directly favor them because they have used it over time. Now, in incorporating uh, close paramount, there is no clear cut or there's no favor of which rules you should incorporate as a close paramount. It depends on individual uh, discussion or. Uh, debate the, the discussion that the two party has on which ones they favor to be incorporated. But ship owners will always go with the plus paramount which they have used over time that favors them. So you as a chakra, you should, you should also uh, know clearly which plus. And sometimes ship owners also in disadvantage because some charters, uh, they are big charters, they have been chartering vessel in that trade for a long time. So they also know really well which uh, close paramounts favor them. So as a ship owner, if you are new engaging in that trade, the charters may, may force some close paramount to be incorporated into the charter party contract, which will go against you as a ship owner. So as a ship owner as well, you also have to know in and out of which uh, close paramount you should incorporate. So 
example with a clause paramount will be uh, issue so, some of the issues that you need to clearly watch out for is example with the time bar. So the time bar, I'm referring to the time limit that a, a, a cargo owner or a charter has to bring a place claim against the, the ship owner. So if something goes wrong with the cargo or something goes wrong during the voyage, the time bar that you have to bring that claim against the ship owner. Under the time charter party, the time bar is six years. So you have six years to bring the case forward, the, bring the claim forward against the ship owner or the carrier. But under the Bill of Leading Rule, especially the Hague Rules, uh, if Hague Rule is incorporated as a clause paramount, the time bar is reduced to one year. The Hague Rule time bar is one year. So therefore, if it's incorporated as a clause paramount, you as a charter, you may be looking at a charter party contract thinking you have six years uh, as a time bar to bring a case against the ship owner. But in reality, because of the clause paramount and the Hague Rule is used, you only have one year to bring the case forward against the charter, uh, the ship owner. So therefore, if you miss that one year time bar without bringing the case forward, and maybe it entered the second year be before you bring the claim against the ship owner, automatically your case is a dead case. You don't, you don't have a case at all. So whatever, you need to consider these, which clause paramount that you incorporate. And in actual operation, you realize that it's very difficult as a cargo owner or charter to bring a case against, claim against a ship owner within one year time bar because it's just, operationally, it's just not visible because operationally, the vessel is taking some months uh, to undertake the voyage to reach the destination. And once the destination, the cargo is discharged and you don't know that this cargo is damaged. You cannot just jump straight forward and say, um, they claim against the, uh, the ship owner. You have to substantiate the claim. You have to make sure your claim is valid. And how will you make the claim valid? You need to collect necessary document information to prove your case. And this information, uh, you have to take this information probably from the, the port authority because at the port of loading, uh, your cargo is in a good condition and you deliver it to the, to the uh, vessel and the cargo is loaded at a part of loading and they, at the discharging port, maybe the cargo is different in different forms. So therefore you want to lay claim against the ship owner. You need to collect uh, information from both ports and also with the stevedore companies as well. And in reality, you realize that this information, getting this information are not just easy, that just you walk and get, get them. Uh, sometimes it, it, takes, it takes months and sometimes even years before you get hold of this information. They will not just bring it to, especially if it's happening in a developing country. It's, you go through a lot of process before you get this information. The only information that you have easily is the status of the cargo before you give it to, to, the, to the ship and then receiving it, those you have. But to substitute exactly what it's okay, it's very difficult. So for you to navigate through and to get all the right information, all the right paperwork, and to bring the case forward before against the ship owner, that one year time bar might, might have gone. And so you, 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 you lose. And so therefore you need to consider this case. And also some of the issues when a clause paramount is included, you should consider is about the, the jurisdiction in which you can, you can lay a claim against the, the ship owner. So those jurisdictions you have to consider because if you don't consider really well, you bring a case against a ship owner under different jurisdiction, your case will be dismissed. Uh, probably maybe if the, the time bar is even short, the ship owner will just leave you to proceed and go to court with you for the time to the time bar expire, then the ship owner will now come back and say, no, your case is in different jurisdiction. This jurisdiction doesn't have a right to judge this case. And then the case will be dismissed that take the case to the right jurisdiction. And before you read the right jurisdiction, the time bar also elapsed. So your case is, is gone. Uh, I think we, we, we should take a break, um, take a five minute break now. And then uh, if we come back, then we, we continue. But before we, we take a break, any, any, any question? No, not for the time being, Pete. No, also. 
All right, we, we take five minute break and then we, we continue. So we start 11, uh, 1107. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm up now, Peter, so yeah. see you next week. All right, it's, yes, yeah. You have a complete, yeah. You have completed timetable there, yeah, all right. Yeah, so uh, we are talking about sea worthiness. So uh, I'm asking that sea worthiness in a practical sense, what does the word sea worthiness mean? Uh, capable of going to sea and able to withstand the, I guess, conditions and demands of going to sea. So being able to withstand rough weather, um, making sure that the vessel isn't uh, easily damaged or um, I guess it's up to code. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, so we have the vessel will be able to withstand the peril of the sea. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the Chara Party play, places the, uh, this obligation on the ship owners that their vessel should be seaworthy. So the seaworthiness, should it be implied or should it be expressed? Should it be expressly provided or it should be implied? It should be implied. I, th I think implied. Oh, yeah, I agree, implied. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, implied and some charter party contracts also uh, make it expressly. Uh, so both implied and expressed. But if it is not expressed, it is implied that seaworthiness is there. But some charter party forms will, will, will expressly state it and other charter party uh, contract would not expressly state it. But if it is not there expressly, it is implied that uh, the vessel should be there. So uh, some charter party form, if you take it, they may not use the word seaworthy, but they may also use different words which may uh, expressly stay saying that the vessel should be seaworthy. So for example, they may, they may say the vessel should be properly fitted and in, for the intended service or they, they may use the word such as stored strong and also starch, tight, uh, uh, hot, tight, hot, and all those words. If they use those words, they may not use the word seaworthiness directly, but what they imply is that the, word, uh, the vessel should be seaworthy. And various other parties also have their own uh, condition that they put uh, regard to seaworthy. For example, if you take the shell time four, uh, the shell time four re re require the vessel to be in class and at the same time, the vessel should have all the necessary certificates by law on board the vessel. So if you chat out with a, sh a shell and you're using the shell time four, even if you have all the qualified uh, seafarers, but you have some of the your certificates not on board, then your vessel is not seaworthy. Even though the vessel may be able to withstand the peril of the sea, uh, the vessel is good, uh, fitted, strong to carry the cargo, but just by not fulfilling that condition, your vessel is not seaworthy. So that also means that the seaworthiness of a vessel, it's, it's much more broader, not just with regard to how physically the vessel should be, should be suitable for the voyage, but it also goes beyond that. For example, the competency of the, the crew on board the vessel, if the crew are not competent, then such a vessel is not seaworthy. Even though the vessel is in good condition, very strong, cannot take the voyage. It may, it may even be a brand new vessel, uh, but if the vessel is not having a competent crew uh, on board, then that vessel may be considered uh, of not be seaworthy. And so, for example, if you look at a Jenko form, Jenko form point, point out in, in the form that the, the ship should be properly manned so which means uh, the, the right people should man the vessel. And if uh, uh, the vessel, uh, for the seaworthiness of the vessel, the common law make it absolute obligation for the charter uh, party contract to make the vessel seaworthy through the entire voyage of the, of, of the, uh, of the contract. And, but however, as we mentioned previously with the clause paramount, 
if a clause paramount is included and the Hague rules is, is being used, the Hague rules also, uh, the Hague rule only require the, the vessel owner or the ship to exercise due diligence. And the vessel should be seaworthy before and at the start of the voyage. So which means if a clause paramount is used, Hague rule is incorporated into the, uh, the contract. And then the vessel um, is fitted and ready good before the start of the voyage. And then the vessel sails from the port. And then during the voyage, uh, something happened and the vessel loads its cargo. For example, maybe just sail from the, from the port one of the main agent or the main agent breaks down and the vessel rather grounded and the cargo is lost, the vessel is lost. With that, you can't say the vessel is not seaworthy because the vessel was seaworthy before and during the start of the voyage. So again, that goes back that when the clause paramount is being incorporated, you should know which rules that you are incorporated into the charter party contract. But if you take, you take that, that charter party contract alone, it will make it absolute obligation for the vessel to be seaworthy through, throughout the entire voyage. So those are some of the, uh, the, the, the issues you have to consider, uh, especially as some of you, uh, maybe you may be working in, in the uh, charter party uh, setup or you are working for the ship owner, you, sh you have to consider these uh, areas as well. So if a ship owner, the due diligence, if the ship owner can demonstrate that he has exercised due diligence, anything uh, outside that, you will not be able to claim uh, against a late claim against the ship owner. Unless you prove the burden uh, or proof on the ship owner uh, that the ship owner didn't exercise due diligence uh, before, uh, during, before the voyage, then the ship owner has the burden of, burden of proof to, to prove that he actually exercised due diligence. Uh, sometimes it can happen with the, the crew, maybe, uh, for example, uh, you should, the ship should be manned with computer seafarers. You have computer seafarers, the captain gives maybe some call, it's a wrong call. And with this, if the, the, the vessel owner can demonstrate that the captain exercises due diligence, you may not be able to, to lay claim against the vessel owner under these uh, rules of exercising due diligence. Unless you can prove a ship that burden of proof to the ship owner, the ship owner will find it difficult. He has to demonstrate actually how he exercises due diligence. If he can't demonstrate it, then you can lay claim against the, the ship owner. Any, any question? Uh, I put a, a server quiz also over here. Which is it true or false? Which one is the correct answer? Um, it is false. Yeah. Okay. Every, everyone go for false. Oh. Yeah, I believe false. I think. Yeah, false. Yeah, uh, that, is, that that is true. Perfect. Yeah, false is is the right answer because. Uh, we've mentioned that when Hague rules, uh, Hague VSB rule is incorporated into the, uh, as a cross paramount, incorporated into the charter party contract, it only requires the ship owner to exercise due diligence or make the vessel seaworthy before and the start of the voyage. So if it can demonstrate that the vessel is seaworthy before and the start of the voyage, that is it. So during the voyage, if something happens, uh, the ship owner is not liable. So it's a force. Now let's talk about the uh, miss uh, representation and for the chapters to have remedies against the ship owner if ship owner breach the city uh, conditions. So what remedies did the chapters have? So if in the situation, if the, sh the ship is un unseaworthy, uh, for example, uh, before the start, uh, before the charter party contract is being signed, uh, the ship owner have to declare uh, the performance of the vessel. So that, that is the speed of the vessel, uh, the fuel consumption of the vessel, and the carry capacity of the vessel. If the, during the, the trade, the charter 
notice that the ship owner give misrepresentation, the charterer has a right to avoid the contract, to cancel the contract, or he also has a right to stay in the contract, affirm the contract, but seek for damages or remedies. So those are the, the options that the, the, the charterer has. So for example, maybe it's with regard to the fuel consumption that the, the ship owner declared that the fuel consumption, uh, maybe fuel consumption per day or whatever, at this speed, it should be this X uh, uh, tons of fuel being consumed. And then in reality, uh, the ship is consuming more than what is being stated during the, the, the signing of the contract. The, the charterer has a right to avoid the contract, get out of the contract, or the charterer also has a right to stay in the contract, affirm the contract, but seek for damages, for misrepresentation. And if there is a breach of a term, and the term is severe, as we mentioned previously, then the charterer has the absolute right to cancel the contract outrightly without staying in, in a contract. And most charter party contracts also has a provision for off high clauses when uh, the, the charter party contract is on the either time charter or the verbal uh, charter. So under the time charter uh, contract, some charter party forms has a provision for off high. So off high, with the sense that the, the charter will stop paying the high money. So we, we, we said in last week that uh, under the time charter, the charter pay high money per day, but this is paid either on a fortnight basis or, or on a monthly basis. So that clause may be included in a charter party contract that the charter should off high the vessel to stop paying the ship owner the high money per day because either the vessel is not able to perform uh, what the charter promised or there is a breach of, of any of those terms or condition. So an example would be uh, if it is agreed that the vessel, uh, during the signing of the charter party contract, that the vessel GS will be used in operation for loading and offloading the cargo. Uh, that means the vessel crane will be used for loading and offloading the cargo. And the vessel is in the port and operation is on the way. They are loading the cargo and then the vessel crane uh, stop working. So there's more function, the vessel crane is not working. So with that, the ship is unable to, to continue working again because the vessel crane is not working. Under that condition, uh, the, the charterer will have a right or the cargo owner will have a right to off high the vessel. So that means to stop paying the high money for the time period or the days that it takes the ship owner to fit the, the crane or put the crane in the position that the crane is back in working. Uh, sometimes maybe depend on the location where the, it, it's happened. Uh, maybe you don't have the, the, tech, the, the, the technician in that very particular port to repair the vessel, uh, to repair the vessel crane. Uh, therefore, maybe technician expert will need to be fly from somewhere into the country to repair the, the vessel crane, which might take a day or two, or maybe three days, four days, five days, depending on how long it takes for them to fit the crane back. For all those days, the vessel will be off high. That means the charter will stop paying the high money. Now, for the charter to off high the vessel, the, the charter have to uh, ascertain on, uh, to prove that the, 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 the claim that he's laying, laying to off high the vessel is a substantial claim, it's a good claim. Uh, because if not, a charter can use any small uh, condition and say, I'm off high in the vessel. So those conditions will be set up in the charter party contract. And it should be a valid claim and the charter have to prove that it's a valid claim before he off high the vessel. Again, for example, like the crane, if the crane spoil, uh, as the crane spoil, the charter in certain con condition, the charter will not just off high the vessel immediately, that the crane is not working. Under the charter party contract, they may put some certain hours to elapse before you can lay the vessel off. So maybe they will say, okay, if the vessel crane is not working, you can't work. After two hours, the crane spoil. If after two hours, the crane is not in position to work again, 
then you can off hire the vessel. So if the vessel crane is not working, maybe for one hour, one hour, 15 minutes, and then the crane is being uh, repaired, it's in position to, to work again, you cannot able to off hire the vessel for that hour that the crane is not working. That will be counted for you as your late time. It will go against you, even though the crane is not working, but it will go against you because you have put in the, con uh, in the contract that uh, you can only off hire the vessel if the crane stop for continue two hours before you can uh, uh, off hire the vessel. So the, the, that off hire clause is, is there in the charter party contract and then that also gives the charter to have remedy to those money. The charter can uh, take that money from the nest of high payment, the directors by not paying the nest of high payment for a certain period of time for those time the vessel is off high. Any, any, any question with, with it? So the charter party usually place obligation on the ship owners which require them to proceed with a dispatch or a further obligation to proceed without unreasonable deviation. So which means that it's usually is expressed in the charter party contract terms that the vessel should proceed with utmost dispatch. Utmost dispatch, and sometimes you will say that it should uh, proceed with reasonable dispatch or convenient dispatch. So which means the vessel need to proceed without deviating from its course. And under the, the common law, it's absolute obligation for the ship owner to proceed on that uh, without deviating. Now, the are uh, certain under certain conditions that the vessel might deviate. Now, with deviation, the the in the contract, it will be agreed that contractual uh, route will be agreed that the vessel need to take this route under the, the contract. Now, the vessel owner cannot just decide to use, or the captain cannot just decide to use different routes if a contractual route is being agreed. If contractual route is not agreed specifically expressed in the, in the contract, then the, the ship owner or the captain may use any direct geographical route. Direct geographical route will become the, 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 the alternative option route to use. Or the, if the, the vessel can prove or the ship owner can prove that there is a customary route that is being used, then the, the ship can use customary routes. That is because the contractual route is not being agreed and there is also not any geographical route or there is, a geograph uh, uh, there is no geographical route. So therefore the ship owner is using the customary route. So the charter cannot uh, claim against the ship owner that is deviating from the route that is supposed to take. Now, under the deviation, uh, there is a liberty clause under the Hague BSB rules, the obligation uh, to the ship owner, uh, also under common law, that the ship owner have the uh, liberty to deviate, but that deviation need to be justified. And under the common law, the deviation can be made if the ship owner or the captain is deviating to save life or save property. Maybe uh, the ship owner is proceeding on the contractual route and uh, uh, proceeding with our utmost dispatch, and then there is a sh another ship in the vicinity send a distress call. If such a distress call, the ship cannot say I'm under the charter party contract and I'm um, obligation to dispatch with utmost dispatch, so therefore I cannot help. No, the ship have to deviate based on that, that it's coming to save life or save property, the ship has that right under the common law to deviate to save life. And also probably maybe a crew on board is seriously sick and at the verge of dying, the, 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 the vessel owner or the captain has a right to deviate to a, a, a nearby port to seek assistance, health assistance for such a crew to seek medical assistance in, in that condition, 
it also will be stated in the contract. So, so in that condition, the vessel owner cannot offer the, the vessel. And mostly if the, the ship owner or the captain deviates and which that deviation is not in the contract, it's a deviation off from the contractual route, that during that deviation time, the vessel will be off high for that period. And therefore, the, the charter will be compensated for, for that. So the captain cannot, or the ship owner cannot take their own initiative decision to deviate on the route, unless it's based on the justification, if any deviation need to be justified. And if that, that is under the, the agreement or under the common law that is permitted, then there will not be any breach of contract under that. But if that deviation is not, uh, is not uh, accepted by the common law or is accepted by the contract, then that deviation will be considered as a breach of contract and the, the, the charter may off hide the vessel for that period of time, the vessel deviated from its contractual route. Any, any question so far? All good. Now, we, we've spoken about the ship owner's obligation and uh, the, the obligation of proceeding on utmost dispatch, uh, reasonable deviation. Uh, let's also uh, talk about the obligation of the charter. So the charter under the charter party also has obligation. Under the, the time charter party, uh, the charter has obligation to nominate a safe port. Now, what is a safe port? A anyone? want to help what a safe port is or what a safe port may be. Anyone want to help what a safe port is? Is a safe port any port along the uh, along the route which if things were to go poorly along the route, then the ship can pull in there? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, a safe port is, is as you mentioned, a safe port is a port that a vessel can call in and come out without any danger to the vessel, uh, without the vessel being in any form of danger or being trapped in in the port so that that is a safe port so a, a charter has the obligation to nominate a safe port to the ship owner that a vessel should go to that port now if a charter nominates a port and the ship owner consider that that port is not safe the ship owner will request the charter to nominate an alternative port so as we said that a safe port should be a port that a ship can get in safe and, and engage in operation and come out safely without any danger. So what would be some of the examples that will make a port an, an, an safe port? What would be some um, of the issues you consider unsafe? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, an unsafe port would be if the um, ship is unable to enter it because of their draft or because of the circumstances of the port. Yeah, so th that is correct. Because of the, the draft draft restriction, yeah, that will make uh, the port unsafe for, for, uh, for the vessel. Any, any, other, any other person? Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if it's right, uh, but uh, does the security level of the port state matter? Yeah, security level. Yeah, that 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 is that is correct. That that's true. Yeah. So if, for, for example, with the security level, as you mentioned, if the security level in a port is at level three, and the vessel is having level one, that port is unsafe for the vessel. Yeah, that that's correct. Yeah, that's true. A any any other person? Any anything that you consider may make port unsafe? Would weather change between whether a port is safe or not? Yeah, whether it is good that you bring you bring out this point. Whether is a very 
a very good point and it's very also controversial sometimes to between the charter and the ship owners it, uh, it brings this kind of uh, debate between the charter and the ship owners in a sense that a bad weather bad weather may be considered uh, may be considered that the port is unsafe but in other way around under the bad weather the port can also be considered as a safe port meaning that if during the bad weather if the crew are competent the cap captain and his crew are competent can maneuver the vessel to the port under bad weather, then that port is a safe port. But if the captain and his crew cannot maneuver the vessel under that bad weather to port and the vessel may get damaged or the cargo may get damaged, then that port is not unsafe. So it's, it's come back to the crew and the crew competence level. And that doesn't mean if the crew cannot uh, get into the port with the bad weather, those crew are not competent. No, they are competent but maybe based on the nature of the weather. But the same weather can be there, another crew, a uh, captain and his crew can, can, can maneuver the vessel safe, in the, can maneuver the vessel into the port. So that, that under that condition, that port will be considered safe. On the other scenario, the vessel will be considered not safe. So it's good good point that you brought weather, weather uh, in. And, um, yeah. Adding to the point of weather, uh, does features uh, like yeah. if it's an open port or um, if there are sea breakers, does that uh, matter? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that matter. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that matter. Yeah. yeah. So an another uh, point that you may consider port and safe would be an uh, issue with political issue. Maybe if there's a war breakup. Or uh, even right in the port, uh, maybe labor, labor uh, arrest in the port. Uh, these also, you can consider these uh, as a port, as an unsafe port. So, unsafe port, if uh, an alternative, uh, a port is nominated, ship owner consider that the port is unsafe, then the ship owner will ask the charter to nominate another alternative port. The, now the charter have to nominate uh, charter have to nominate another alternative port, and that alternative port, if it is safe, then the ship owner will proceed uh, to that port. And if that alternative port also is not safe, then the charter the ship owner will request the charter to nominate another uh, alternative port, and then the vessel uh, will, will sail to that port. But the, however, if a ship owner considers the port unsafe and then the charter nominates the port and the ship owner accepts the, the offer to proceed to that port and then the ship owner is on the way to the port, the vessel is on its way to the port and then the ship owner gets to realize that no, it's so much dangerous for the vessel. So therefore the port is unsafe and the ship owner want to reject the offer and ask the charter to nominate another alternative port. And the law, that ship owner cannot request alternative port. The ship owner have to proceed to the port that is unsafe. Because he knew the port is unsafe and the order is placed, he accept the, the, the offer and he accept the order, proceeding to the port before he realized how serious and dangerous it is for the vessel. So the ship owner have to still continue and proceed to the port even though it's unsafe. And if the vessel is damaged, then he is liable though to ask for, for remedy from the charter. But he can't, he, can't, he can't stop that, no way, I'm not going to the port, the port is unsafe. Uh, no, he, you have, he, has, uh, he or she have accepted the offer when he knew the port is unsafe, so he have to still proceed. But if he accepts the uh, uh, charter, give the, uh, the order, and then he proceed going before the port become unsafe, then the, the, the ship owner will ask the, the, the charter to nominate alternative port. Because at the time of giving the order, the port is safe, and he accepts the order. And now he's getting there, he knows that he realizes that the port is unsafe. Under that circumstance, he will ask the charter to nominate alternative port and the charter have to do so. And any, 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 any question with that? Ah, uh, no, sounds pretty good. 
Yeah, okay. Awesome. Yeah, good. So uh, when a, a ship, uh, probably a ship is in a port, then all of a sudden, war break up. And then the ship is trapped in a port. Uh, under that condition, the, 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 the ship owner will ask for uh, remedy or damage from the, uh, the, the charterer, but to certain, uh, based on the situation. Certain situation, none of the party, no, uh, none of the party will be able to, to, to claim. The ship owner cannot claim because under that condition, it's twofold. The ship owner cannot have a ship to go and undertake another voyage. At the same time, the cargo owner, his cargo is also trapped on, on board the vessel in the port. So that, that is a, a different uh, area. So we shall talk about that in, in the next slide. Yeah, uh, sample quiz over here. Is it which one is the correct answer, true or false? That's true. 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 Correct. Yeah. Perfect. Correct. Yeah, it's true. For political reason. Yeah. Now we also the another our last point to talk about is about frustration for our last uh, slide. It's about the frustration under the charter party contract. Any anyone want to help with what a frustration may be under the charter party contract? Um, yeah. Uh, is it when, uh, through no fault of either party, um, the contract just uh, becomes invalid? Yeah, 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 that, that, that's correct. So a, a frustration of a contract takes place when there's to prevent event, uh, which either none of the party, uh, it's no fault of the party, and that has made, it make it so significant, has changed the nature of the contract. So therefore, under that circumstance, the, this contract will be considered as a frustration. So, which means that uh, the contract is being signed and that during the contract, there is a sad supervenient event which has made the contract. So for, for example, um, uh, if a ship is proceeding, or maybe during, uh, let me use the example, during uh, some times back, years, decades ago, uh, the Swiss Canal was closed, and a vessel are uh, proceeding on each course, contrary course, to use a Swiss Canal, and that is a shorter possible route, and the canal is closed. So if a canal is closed, now the, the vessel cannot go through the Swiss Canal, and the vessel have to use alternative routes, which is we're going through the Cape of Good Hope around, around the Horn of Africa, then uh, all the way to Europe. Now, under this condition, the, 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 the distance become much more longer, the voyage become much longer, and the consumption also become much more consumption because the, the, the voyage become longer, much more consumption, which means oppression expenses is so high and under that condition the ship owner cannot declare the contract as a frustration so under the frustration even though we say it's none of event which is none of the party's fault under this condition example that i stated the ship owner cannot declare a frustration under that contract simply because the voyage become expensive and long to undertake does not make the contract frustration. But in the same scenario, if the, the cargo that the, the, the vessel is carrying, the ship owner is carrying, that cargo uh, is a perishable cargo uh, that due to the taking alternative route, longer route, and that going to make the, the cargo perish during the voyage or make the cargo the cargo need on certain time at the destination and is not going to fulfill that under that condition then the contract can be, will be considered as a frustration 
and then the both party will be will be exit from the the contract and no party will be liable for damage under under that uh, situation so which also means that an increase in freight rate increase in freight rate exponentially cannot just make the contract uh consider that, that contract to be uh, for frustrated And again, with example, with a ship, maybe a ship trapped in a port, maybe due to uh, unrest, uh, war broke up, and the ship in the in the port, and then uh, war broke up, then the ship is trapped in the port. The ship cannot sail. Uh, the ship owner cannot have access to his ship. Cargo owner, cargo also stuck on board the vessel under this condition. Uh, if this prolonged. Uh, the, the, the contract will be considered as a frustration and both parties will exit the, the contract with no uh, liability uh, for another party. And also, sometimes uh, bad weather can also result, consider the contract to be under uh, frustration, uh, especially in some, some regions. Your vessel can be in a port all of a sudden, then there is a heavy snow, and uh, that will seriously block the, the channel so the vessel cannot exit the port, the vessel cannot sail off. And these, these can maybe continue uh, for months, depending on the, on the weather and the, the region where it is. So if the ship is trapped under that condition, there's no way the vessel can, can sail off. Then under that con condition, the, the, this contract also can be considered as a frustration. Any, any question? Any, any question? Yeah, I put um, a sample quiz over here. Uh, before we, we close. Uh, under this, would this be considered as a first rate? No, that's that's false. Everyone go with false. Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe so too. False. Someone go for true? Surely it would be false because the ship would be unseaworthy if the sh crew wasn't complete. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, 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 is, that is correct. So you can't just declare, uh, uh, consider the, the contract, the charter party contract frustrated just because uh, uh, the, the crew are incompetent. So we, so for, for, well, let's take example, uh, maybe the, the crew and incompetent, the crew uh, make a decision and then grounded the vessel and then the cargo is lost, the vessel is lost, uh, the ship owner cannot de declare under this uh, for, for frustration. So it's not, the contract is not considered frustrated. But maybe under the same, uh, the same scenario, uh, the the vessel is grounded is grounded uh, simple because uh, there is an engine failure and then the vessel grounded the cargo is lost and the vessel is lost under these uh, these uh, the, it may be considered uh, the contract may be considered as frustrated uh, because this issue is not a not a the, the ship owner's fault or the crew's fault, not the, the charter's fault. So under that, it may be considered frustrated. But even that, the ship owner really have to prove that also have to go back to the due diligence. If the charter can prove, if the charter can prove that the ship owner actually uh, didn't do a proper maintenance that has caused the agent to fail for the vessel to be grounded and for both the cargo and the vessel to loss, total loss, 
then the, char the ship owner cannot declare the, the contract, this contract cannot be considered frustrated because then it is the ship owner's fault. Maintenance need to be done on the engine and he didn't do the maintenance and that has resulted in that. So therefore the contract will not be considered frustrated. But if the ship owner approved that proper maintenance is done and it's done according to the, the, the time to the time and according to the class requirements, then the contract will be considered frustrated. So yeah, whatever it is, it, it, it is a legal barrier with the issues. It's not just straightforward issue, uh, unless you state it clearly in the contract, expressly uh, in the contract, setting uh, conditions. So once it happened, then you know, are uh, the way to take, but if it is not expressly uh, 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 expressed, then uh, this condition is become a legal battle for you to combat, uh, because the ship owner will want to declare for, for the contract frustrated, and the charter also want to prove that no, this cannot be considered frustrated because maybe the ship owner didn't exercise due diligence or the ship owner uh, didn't during didn't do it his homework work didn't maintain or probably maybe. Uh, is the crew that make a wrong uh, call and make a wrong decision. That's what that happened. So therefore, you can consider the contract as, as frustrated. But if it's not, not at the fault of the crew, not the ship owner, then the contract will be considered frustrated. Thank you very much. Uh, so this brings us to the end of today's lecture. We, we, we spoke about uh, the use of bill of lading and the seaway bill and consider, look at some of the standard charter party forms, and then also Hague, his BB rule, Hamburg rule, if it's incorporated into the charter party contract as a cost paramount. And then we also spoke about the obligation of the ship owners with regard to the seaworthiness, uh, dispatch and deviation, and then the charter has obligation to nominate a safe port. And then finally, we also spoke about the uh, frustration and the cancellation of the charter party contract. So that brings us to the end of our today's uh, discussion on lectures. Uh, I have tutorial question which we can discuss now, uh, or we we come back later and and discuss. But uh, to to me, uh, I would say we just take a five minutes break, and then you can look at uh, this point and then we, we discuss it. Good. Yeah, so we take five minutes break and then we continue. So 11.55 and then we, 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 we start a tutorial discussion shortly. All right, um, let's start with our uh, tutorial. So our tutorial question, uh, as on the screen, is, is our, you are uh, owing a 95,000 DWT Aframas tanker, uh, which is open in uh, Rotterdam. And therefore, I'm asking you to choose three possible form of charter and explains the method of remuneration and give example of the form of the charter party that you may you may be used in each case. So any, any form of the charter that you choose, in each case, which form of the ch charter party forms will you use? So that, that is our first uh, questions that we are looking at. So in this case, in question A, uh, what, what possible, which three possible charter party will you engage in knowing that you have this uh, 95,000 DW3 Aframas tanker? And which is open in Rotterdam, as we explained in model one, if the vessel uh, is, we say the vessel is open, I mean the vessel, uh, come into the market looking for uh, 
a charter or looking for cargo to carry and looking for contract to, to fix. So uh, the vessel is open for you. You have empty vessel uh, available. And so which possible form of charter, trade form of charter will you choose to engage this vessel in? Is everyone everyone with with me? Yeah, I'm 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 with you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Peter. Thanks. So under these that you have. Um, the vessel, uh, you have uh, empty uh, vessel available for you at the port of Rotterdam. And so what form of charter will you, will you consider to engage in with this vessel? Um, uh, I was reading the module one, uh, like the first reading last night, and it said that most of the, um, like bulk tankers in the modern era operate on the spot market. So is that like a contract of a freightment? Yeah. So here, yeah. so, so the, the, the spot market, you can consider that as a voyage, uh, voyage uh, setter as well. So you, you consider that as a voyage. So you are going for every, every, every voyage uh, individually. So you finish one voyage and then you'll be looking for, alternative voyage, or even before you finish that voyage, uh, you are looking for alternative voyage. For, for example, like this one, this example, uh, that you already know that your vessel will be open in Rotterdam because that is the port you're going to deliver uh, the, the next cargo. So once you know that over there, once you, you offload the cargo, you deliver in Rotterdam, uh, your vessel will be open from there. Your vessel will, will be open, so therefore, you'll be looking for alternative before even you get to Rotterdam. Yeah, so the voyage, voyage uh, will be the spot market that you, you're entering. Uh, you are open up to whatever that comes or the market brings. Uh, you are open up to, to that. You want to yeah, take that, that risk going into the, the market as uh, what the price may be. You are embracing that. Would it would it be possible to do a demise bare boat charter as well for this for this tanker since it's got um, nothing sort of pre-organized with it? Yeah, so that that's that's also an option you could use. Uh, probably maybe uh, at a time uh, that your vessel is open in in Rotterdam, uh, maybe as at that time the freight rate is high, and uh, due to market speculation, you have in mind that maybe the freight rate in future may drop. And so therefore you want to go in for bare boats, you want to go in for very long, long years contract and knowing that you have secure a good daily high money for your vessel for that long period of time. So that could be an option. And uh, it could also happen that maybe as at the time your vessel is open, the freight rate is it's, it's down, the freight rate is really low. So if you, you go for bare boat as at that time, you have your daily income all right, but your long-term future earning may not be good because you have fixed your vessel under the bare boat as at the time that the freight rate is not, is not good, not strong enough. And so maybe you charge it under the bare boat, then six months along the line, uh, the freight rate is just going off the roof. And you will see the chatra making very huge profits, and then you you are only getting uh, some small money for your daily high, which you have nothing to do. There's nothing you can do uh, because you have already chatted it under the bare boat. So that that is also an option, and uh, you could use. And also depending on the on the time, and as we also said last week, that they, as a ship owner, you have 
options to use to mitigate your risk. So that could be a very good strategy to use out of the time. In the long run, it, may, it might really pay well for you because the freight rates really is just going down. So then you will be making good money, the chakra will be losing. Like maybe just the recent uh, event, uh, maybe you have chartered your vessel for a bear boat and then all of a sudden these uh, issues and economy recession, things setting, you'll be making good money while the chakra will be losing. But if the coin flip the other way around also, that side is also real. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so like with part B, the benefits and disadvantages will, will depend on the circumstances for the ship. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's correct, yeah. Same, same, same like a bear boat, uh, 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 same like the, um, the, the first option of going for um, voyage chara, going for the spot market. Yeah, the spot market is, is a brave decision to take uh, for the ship owners. As a ship owner, if you're taking the option of the spot market, it's a brave decision to take because uh, you, you, you already know that the market, the shipping market is cyclical. And anything at all can happen. Uh, the economic condition might quickly change, or some political issues might, might, might change the landscape, or the, the fuel price. A lot of things can, can, can easily change uh, the freight market. So going into the spot market is also a, a brave decision as a ship owner to take that you are ready for the risk, no matter what it is. If, the price is good, you take it. If it's bad, you take it. So yeah, it depends on, 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 on the situation and the time. But as a ship owner, or not just ship owner, uh, a manager in a shipping company, or if you're working uh, with the chakra, so you also need to make a decision. You have to take a bold decision, and this will be based on market speculation or your own uh, gut to take the risk. That is also there. Yeah. So there is no uh, right or wrong to rate, but it depends on the time that you are taking the decision and the condition in which you are taking the decision that make it a bad decision or a, a good decision. Yeah, any, any, any other point anybody have? So uh, what, what, what type of um, method of remuneration uh, will you, will you uh, adopt? And also, what type of charter party forms will, will you use in, in each case? Any, anyone want to give it a go? So what, what type of remuneration and what type of charter party forms will, will, you, will you use? Um, well, I guess for the first type of a charter party, the yeah. boy charter party, the remuneration would be payment for the service of voyage, taking um, cargo from A to B. So it's the payment for that, really. Yeah. So the freight to the freight. Yeah. And then the second one for a time charter party would be uh, payment for control of the vessel for a certain period of time. Yeah. Through um, monthly payments or a fixed cost or whatever they decide. And then the final one would be um, payment for the full control or possession of the vessel 
over a period of time. Great. Good. So uh, what about the form? What type of charter party form do you think uh, you may consider using for uh, each of the, uh, the contracts? Any, any idea on what uh, type of uh, charter body forms you may, you may use uh, for any of the contracts? Um, can you, I'm, I'm just not exactly sure what you mean by the form of charter party, like, what, like the, the form. What, what uh, yeah, so the, the form, we, we spoke about it. Uh, that the charter party form when you are entering into the contract, they are standard and specific forms. So we spoke about forms like Jenko form. Uh, we we spoke about form like share time four, and we also mentioned about the uh, the abstract ab uh, forms, and we also talk, talk about Amwishly form. So any of those forms, uh, some of the forms are used for voyage and some are also for time, and some are also used for verbal, uh, mainly you, you're still going to use some of the time charter forms as well. So that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm referring to as a form. I would use GenCon as the voyage charter party. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's correct. So GenCon is generally used for voyage charter party, so that, that is absolutely true, yeah. So um, the time, is there any forms that anybody has? I will use the BIM call as the form of the time charter. Yeah, so that, that, is, that may be true, but they, they have various forms. They, they have various forms. So which one will you, will you use? Would shell time be an appropriate one, Peter? Yeah, shell time is appropriate. Shell time is for, for oil. So yeah, it's, it's appropriate form that you could use. And uh, that might mean that, okay, you are uh, signing a contract with shell. So you are carrying the cargo for shell. And you may, as an independent, uh, maybe if you are signing the contract with independent uh, ship owner and a charter uh, or contract with different oil company, you, you may want to use, they may allow that you should use shell time for, but then you will not have the right to amend certain clauses because that is specific for, for shell time for. So yeah, using shell time for is, is for, it's a time charter form for, for oil. So therefore you can use it, but that means you may mainly be engaging in a contract with, with, with shell. So that is correct, yes. And for a bare boat charter, you'd use Bearcon, is that correct? Yeah, that's also, that's also correct. Yeah, you could, you could use that, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's correct. And then also the abstract form is also the, um, it's, uh, it's also the form used for, for tankers. So you could, you could use that, but we also have the abstract void uh, which is the tanker, but it's used for voyage. So it's used for, for, for voyage. NIP 93 is also a charter party uh, form, which also uh, could be used for uh, charter party, uh, but mostly uh, most people would, would tend to use that for other general, um, uh, general maybe in a dry box setter, used for the dry box time, time charter party or uh, the tribal bubble time charter party. So under under this, um, if you are limited in just carrying crude oil, then yeah, any of the uh, the forms for for oil, uh, you are absolute uh, right to use any of them. So you are not limited to use specific unless you are signing the contract with. Uh, 
individual oil majors or major companies which have their own individual forms that they may want you to use. But even that, again, it depends on the negotiation. They may want you to use their form, but also maybe depend on, on your strength of negotiation. You may negotiate some uh, terms out of, out of it. But beside that, yes, you are free to use the, any of the BIM forms or maybe any of the uh, parties that we mentioned, you are liable to use any of those standard forms uh, in the contracts. So the, the, what would be the benefits of, for example, advantage and disadvantage of using each form of employment, which the form of employment goes to the, the type of the, the employment that you are engaging your vessel in. So uh, for example, you, uh, you, some, you chose uh, voyage, time, and bear boat. So what would be the uh, advantage and the disadvantage, the benefit and disadvantage of using uh, those type of uh, forms? So if you use the form, for example, if you use the Jenko form, that means you are engaged in a voyage charter party. And if you use share time, share time for to, uh, that means you are engaging in, in a time uh, charter party. So, or NIP 93, you are engaging in a time charter party. So if you use any of those forms, which also link to the type of charter party that you engage in. So the, at each type of charter party that you engage in, what would be the advantage and the disadvantage? Maybe starting with the voyage. Um, so one of the disadvantage would include uh, volatile freight rates. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is true. And any, any uh, disadvantage? Anyone with any uh, advantage or disadvantage with the, uh, the voyage, Chara? You need to continually find new employment for the vessel. Yeah, that is very challenging, especially in, in a situation where the economy is not doing well. Uh, you don't have any uh, more of uh, cargo owners out there, producers or uh, manufacturers, uh, mining companies, uh, then it becomes very challenging. Yeah, that's true. Any, any other disadvantage or advantage for the vo uh, voyage? As a, as a ship owner, you retain a bit more control over the ship, don't you, compared to the other charter parties? That is absolutely true, yeah. And that is also the reason why you would like to uh, operate under the bare boat as well. You have absolute control over your vessel and you know, you know how to, which, which voyage to take and which port to go, which cargo to load. You have that absolute control. Yeah, that is absolute perfect. And that will be one of the conditions where uh, some ship owners who just want to go under the uh, with the voyage, and also the with that also goes with the management of the vessel as a whole. Uh, you have full control uh, when you can pull the vessel, uh, maybe uh, to which area, what do you want to work on. Yeah, you have that control. Yeah, that's true. Any 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 other points with regard to uh, voyage charter with, with whether advantage or disadvantage? And, and with that control that I was talking about, Peter, you also encounter a lot of the cost. You don't share the cost with anyone. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, the, the cost, you, care, you, you incur all the costs. And that also can, can sometimes maybe also come with some a good uh, revenue for you as well. If probably maybe the freight rate is doing well, you are having a good spot market for, uh, rate. That, that, that could be good for you as well. If you're having good uh, 
uh, rate, spot market rate, uh, that, that would be good. But if the spot market price is, is bad, then that cost, you are really going to feel it more uh, because you are taking care of all the costs and it's just too much. Your revenue is not meeting the, the cost. Yeah, that's a good point. Any, any, any other one, any, any other person want to contribute with uh, either advantage or disadvantage of the spot market? Could you classify it as more simple? Like you wouldn't have additional parties within the contract, but like between charterers and um, ownerships of cargo and stuff? That, 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 that is, that, that's a good, a good point also to, uh, to raise. So with, with this, you, you are aware of having a lot of complication of dealing with several parties within the charter party contract. So it's just you and the cargo owner. That is it. Yes. That, that is absolutely true. Yeah. It's a good point. Unlike maybe if a time charter or bebo charter, uh, you have a lot of, uh, lot of people in between. Uh, you have under the bear boat, you have a lot of time charter as well, uh, as well as voyage charter. And then you also had the free forwarders as, uh, as NVOCC, uh, non vessel operated common carriers also in there. So it's become much more complicated uh, that you can't get your head around it. And if one person is defaulting uh, uh, from as a ship owner, if the, the main charter, disponent charter, as we mentioned, uh, previously, if there is a default there, disponent on a default payment of freight, and your vessel is actually working, any revenue, and he's not paying you, uh, how do you approach and get your uh, income? That becomes much more complicated. It's not just straightforward uh, as it's, you can say. So yeah, to avoid those uh, complications and all those things, yeah, Voyage Ara will make it easier for you. That is just you and the cargo owner, whatever issue may be, it's just settled between the two of you. Yeah, that's good. Any 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 other point? Then what what about the the time and the bare boat charter? What would be some of the advantage or disadvantage uh, with, with them? Um, considering that our ship is not. Uh, very uh, big in capacity wise. I think a um, time charter could be good because we can kind of um, lock ourselves in for a longer period of time. Hmm. And not have to worry about Locking at a good rate. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can continue. Oh, I've uh, lost it. No, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, so locking the, the, the contract for, for a long period of time that, that you, you know that you have that constant income in. Uh, revenue coming in, uh, which also can easily help you uh, pay your loans off or the interest on the loan off. Yeah, that's good. The, the other way to look at that is that because our ship is smaller, you might have people who are looking to uh, take on voyage charters and other sort of charters with a smaller ship. Uh, if the freight rate's going down and they haven't got as much freight to actually move, they don't want to have such a big ship that may have more costs and that sort of thing. So our ship being a bit smaller may fit their needs a bit better. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. That's also a good point, yes, that's true. Great, awesome. Um, if freight rates do increase, but it's already leased out, you, the ship owner, will miss out on those potential revenues? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you, you lose those revenue. You, you, you see your ship making a, a huge fortune for someone who doesn't invest in, in a ship and you are the one who invests in it and paying interest on it, you're not making any good profit in it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, any, any other the final point, final contribution before we, we, we close? Anyone, either the disadvantage or the advantage, the benefit or disadvantage of the, either the time or the bearable? Well, like you said before, with the, um, with the situation of um, the bear boat, um, you, you, you run the risk of um, losing, losing money if freight rates go up or like 
in, or the opposite situation, if freight weights go down, you, you have a chance of earning more money. So it, it depends on the situation, um, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank, thanks, thank you all. Thank everyone uh, for uh, today. Uh, so we will end it here. And next week, uh, we will continue uh, with Mother Trey. Any, any question from any, anyone, whether regarding this um, topic we discussed today or last week or any question in general? Any, anybody have any question? Uh, no, not at this time, Pete. All right. Thank you, son. Right, so see you all next week. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for that. Okay, bye. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Peter. Have a great week. Same to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, Peter, I got questions for the yeah. form for the form of the charter party. Yeah. Is there I is there any reading like provided in the reading list for the like you you mentioned the time the Gen Con is suitable for the world charter and the bell time is suitable for the time charter, is it right? Yeah, yes, yes. So is there any reading? inside the reading list for the more detail for the form of the charter party yeah there, yeah there, there is a reading yeah there's a reading uh so in in the in the reading i've uh, mentioned or uh, i've list out uh some of the charter party forms uh over there so those charter party forms if you if you look at it uh, you will see uh that which charter party forms belong to which organization and which uh charter party does it cover so as I mentioned, like if you pick a Jenko like this, Jenko is just generally for voyage charter. So most common voyage charter, all voyage charter, you will see them using the Jenko charter party form. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter. No worries. Okay, no worries. see you next week. Yeah, hey, I'll see you next, next week. See ya. Yeah, bye. Bye. Yeah, Steph, do, do, do you have any question for me? Steph, any question you have for me? All right, see you all.